people will look back and he will look at what his life has been and any of us that knows anything about the life of Paul would say that Paul had a life at times of great hardship and great persecution, right? I think all of us would say that. And yet Paul will say when he writes to Timothy, his son in the faith, near the end of his life, he's going to say, I was the worst of sinners, but the mercy of God was poured out on me as an example for everybody else in the future who might one day come to salvation. I wonder if some of you sitting here this morning would look at that and you would say, yep, you're talking about me. I look at that and you're speaking about my life. If Paul could receive God's grace and God's mercy and he was a murderer and he was a hater and a persecutor of the church, he he approved and took the lead in the killing of Stephen, an innocent and holy and righteous man. If, if Paul could be saved, if Paul could have grace, if Paul could have mercy, if God could be patient with such a bad guy, really such a bad guy, then there's hope for me. Maybe that has spoken to your heart before. And that's what Paul says at the end of his life. And we'll get to that next week, but that just gives you a foretaste. But that's where the title comes from, Mercy to the Worst of Sinners. And it's from 1 Timothy chapter 1, and it's at the very end of your notes this morning. And so I wanted to include that. I, I was thinking about it. I always pray about, Lord, what should the title be? How should it be? Because it, it, it gives us a, dir a direction and a focus. And I really felt that all week long as I've been thinking about that, this is what has been on my heart. It could be mercy to the worst of sinners or grace to the greatest of sinners. Um, and, that, and that's what chapter 9 is all about. So let's look at it this morning. Uh, we've just finished with chapter 8, and we know what chapter 8 was. Chapter 8 was great, wasn't it? Chapter 8 was Philip going up to the city, the Samaritan city, and the Holy Spirit ministered through Philip. And with great anointing and great power, when we say the Holy Spirit, it's God the Spirit or the Spirit of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit ministers through Philip and people are delivered from demonic bondage. People who are sick are healed. People who are paralyzed are set free. People who had no hope and were in death and going to hell now were on their way to heaven. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit. People followed the Lord in water baptism, which is what we're going to see and participate in in just a, a few days. And by the way, the end of this chapter, uh, verse 19 or so, has uh, Saul's, Paul's bapt water baptism also. So there's just another point for you. We won't get that far this morning, but I'm going ahead and telling you now that, um, that that's the end of this section as well. So we have all of this, then we have the great, so the great revival, then we have the Holy Spirit leading Philip all the way to the desert road. He meets the Ethiopian eunuch. He is wonderfully saved. What should keep me from being baptized, he believes. We have the wonderful uh, upgrade in transportation when he is whooped out of the road, uh, the desert road, and he's taken to Azotus and so on. Um, and we have this beautiful picture of chapter 8, but there's something else that's going on in the background. And the beginning verses of chapter 9 tell us what's going on in the background. And so we look at this in the background, uh, Acts 9, 1 and 2, meanwhile. So meanwhile tells you while all of chapter 8 was going on, the, the revival, the this, the that, all of that, meanwhile Saul. So here's this beautiful picture in the front. And in the background, Saul is doing his dirty work. He really is. He's doing his dirty work. Now, I've included a map again because um, I'm a visual sort of person and it helps me to see. So Saul is down here. We know that Philip is somewhere up in this area and then down in here when he goes on the desert road. But Saul is here and he is still going strong. You would think that the gruesome martyrdom of Stephen would have satisfied him or would have 
softened his heart in some way, right? Wouldn't you think so? This terrible to be stoned to death. Instead, what we see is that it was almost like lighting a fire under Saul. Um, and as we see, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Or some translations say he was breathing murder, if you will. This is very, very strong. I, I think had you and I lived then, or if Saul were living now, um, Saul would not have been an easy person to be around, I think. Uh, he is obviously a man of great passion, isn't he? And great action as well. So he's uttering threats with every breath, eager to kill the Lord's followers. Notice uh, that they're not called Christians yet. They're not called Christians till some years later, and that will be in Antioch, another city, um, that we'll read about. I think it's about chapter 11 or so. So here is, he's called the Lord's followers. And then we're going to see something else. Uh, so he goes to the high priest and he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Take a look at this with me as we, as we consider and as we go through this. Uh, by the way, because I'm just so gifted in this area. I've divided this section into four, and I've called each, sec each, each section a different word beginning with the letter C, because, you know, that's just the way I am. It helps me to remember. If you are a non-native English speaker, then I am so sorry. Translation into another language won't help you. But if you're speaking English this morning, all the C's will help you. I call this first section the campaign, okay, it's in your notes. This is Saul's campaign of terror against the Christians, against the church. But notice with me, so you'll see it at the bottom, and then you'll also see it on the back, on the back side of your page, if you want to look on the back of your page. So the first part is the campaign, and it's Saul's campaign. But I want you to notice with me, uh, and let me ask you some questions. So here, the Lord's followers, they're not yet called Christians, they're called disciples, they are called believers, and then look at verse 2, followers of the way. That's another expression for people who believed in Jesus at that time. They're not yet called Christians. There is a very well-known church uh, on the West Coast in the United States. Julie would know this church. And uh, the pastor, the senior pastor who's retired now is Pastor Jack Hayford, who's written many, many books. And his church is called, the church is called the Church on the Way, right? The Church on the Way. Uh, and it's taken from this. This was one of the earliest names to describe those who followed Jesus, the followers of the way. And I kind of like that, don't you? Because it's not just, oh, they believed this or they uh, were participants in this. It describes a lifestyle, the followers of the way. And so as we read this, we see what happens. Let me ask you some questions. You know a little bit about Saul already. Now, some of you, let's go ahead and settle one point. We have Saul and what was his other name? Paul. Okay. I always used to think, and maybe you did as well, that Saul was his non-Christian name and Paul was his Christian name, right? Yes. Wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, I found that out also. So Saul is his Jewish name, the Hebrew name, okay? And of course, at that time, he didn't, he didn't, uh, didn't have anything to do with Gentiles and Romans and others like that. He used his Jewish name, so he's called Saul. Paul is his Roman name, okay? Or the Gentile name. It's, it's really, it's as simple as that. So Saul, Jewish name. Paul, Roman name, okay? His Roman name. And of course, later on, when he was reaching the Gentiles and speaking in Roman cities and in the Roman provinces, he used the name Paul much more because that identified him more with those, those with, uh, to those with whom he was trying to reach, to speak, right? And, and trying to reach. So it's, will, but usually we'll still separate Saul and Paul, but anyhow. If, if I throw out Saul or Paul, you just know it's the same one, okay? Let me ask you a question about Saul's background as we go through this um, so that we are interacting together on this. Saul, we already know he's very zealous. What party, what religious party is he part of in, in, uh, in, in uh, Palestine at that time? Is he a zealot? Is he a Sadducee? Is he a Pharisee? What is he? He's a Pharisee. Okay, they held very strictly to the law. They didn't always have a lot of political power, but they were very, very religious, okay? And 
often Jesus had conflict when he was still walking on the earth with the Pharisees because they were the religious experts. And here comes along this guy from Nazareth. Who do you think you are? You're from Galilee. And, and you're a religious expert. So that's why there was so much conflict with the Pharisees. But then there was another party, and it was the party that was in power, and it was the political party that cooperated with the Romans. Who were they? The Sadducees. What party was the high priest part of? Sadducees. So I want us to see something here this morning. Paul was a devout Pharisee. In fact, later on he, say, I was a, he will say, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, really, he was a Pharisee. And he was very proud of being a Pharisee. But what does he do? He goes to the high priest who's a Sadducee. Why does he do that? And why does he work with them? In his misguided zeal and in his hatred against followers of the way, he was very happy and very willing to cooperate with anybody and any group that would give him power and access to persecute and to, to grab followers and believers of Jesus wherever they were. And the, and the political religious authorities, the Sadducees and the high priest, had the power to do that. We look at this and we think, well, how can the high priest do that? Isn't he kind of like, you know, a pastor but a bad one? Not at all. In that day, uh, the Sadducees and the rulers, they had power over Jewish people. They had power, they had legal power. And so that's why Paul goes, Saul goes to him. He asks for letters for the synagogue in Damascus. Okay, let's look a little bit about Damascus. This is on your page again. Here's Jerusalem. There's Damascus all the way up there. How far? Traveling by road, uh, not by plane, and unlikely by cart or even by horse, because when we read what happens next, he falls to the ground, the others are standing around, and so on. So as far as we know, Saul walks from Jer with his companions, he walks from Jerusalem to Damascus. It's about 140 miles. How many kilometers is 140 miles? Uh, Chris says about 300. Oh, 225. Oh. In the meantime, Chris has Googled it, and he's got <laughs> because Chris is just that kind of guy, right? <laughs> okay, so 225 kilometers, okay? And Saul, this tells you, you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, why are you stressing this so much? It tells us something about Saul, right? He is in Jerusalem. He's not content to hound the believers in Jerusalem. He is now targeting other cities. In fact, later on, Saul is going to give in his testimony testimony about himself in my obsession that's the word he uses in my obsession I hounded believers in other foreign cities that's what he says about himself so he's willing to go from Jerusalem to Damascus 225 kilometers walking on foot uh, it took about a week a week that's right it's it's a long way and it's whew, whew, it's effort but in his zeal and hatred, he was willing to do this. Why Damascus? Because Damascus had a very large Jewish population. Now, all the cities nearby would have some Jewish population, but Damascus, because of where it was and because of the passage and because of the roads that came through there, had probably 30 or 40 synagogues in the city. And synagogues, at that time, the early followers of Jesus still identified with synagogues. They would still meet with other believers in Judaism who followed all the law, and the early believers all followed the law themselves as well, didn't they? They still kept the law. They still, they still didn't understand all of the freedom that was in Christ and that, they had, that Christ had fulfilled the law completely. Paul understood that later. And so he targets Damascus also because if Christianity gets a foothold in this city, it will really spread to other areas and influence many more areas. And in his hatred, he wanted to stop the followers of Jesus while they could still be stopped. And so he targets that. So here we have his campaign. He's going to go to Damascus and bring these men and women back to Jerusalem in chains. And then they will be tried. And then they will either be imprisoned or they'll be put to death. Because later on, Saul, Paul, says, I murdered. And he, he didn't just mean Stephen, right? He meant others as well. So here we have the campaign. So he sets out on the road to Damascus. And that's the first part. But we know 
that most of chapter 9 is not about Saul's campaign. It is about what happens next. And what happens next is so significant in his confrontation and conversion that Saul himself, after chapter 9, two more chapters in the book of Acts, chapter 22 and chapter 26, most of the chapter, he will again tell the story of what he was like, his confrontation with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and what happened as a result. Do you know that historians, even those that do not follow Jesus or are religious in any way, agree that this event is one of the defining events of human history. Did you know that? Because of the influence Paul would have on the church, on the letters. More than one-fourth of the New Testament was written by Paul. More than one-fourth by one man. Once God grabbed hold of him, as we're going to see in this chapter. And so he sets off, and then we come to... So what I've done... Um, Let's look at the, uh, we go to the next part. So the first part is the campaign. The second part is what? Boom, the confrontation. So let's look at the next passage as we look. Um, and here we have, we're going we're gonna to read through several, but I want to, in the, interest, uh, in the interest of complete transparency, what I want you to see is this. Wherever there's italics, it is not from chapter 9, but it's from chapter 22 or chapter 26, Okay. But I just wanted to underscore that to us so that we see how important it is. Three times, almost three full chapters in the book of Acts, the conversion, the confrontation, the conversion of Saul is, is, deeply, um, is, is deeply explained with more and more details each time. I was thinking about this because here Luke records it as it happened, as history. In chapter 22 and chapter 26, Paul gives it as his testimony right? He stands before the crowd of Jews and he gives the testimony. And then later he will stand before King Agrippa and he will say, this is what happened. I was thinking about that this week and I read something. It was something I was reading online. This was not even a Christian writer, but I so thought of Paul and I thought of some of us. Um, and it was something, it was the, the saying that I, that I read was, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. Isn't that great? Every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. And certainly when we, that's, if we were tweeters in this church, that's worth tweeting, right? <laughs> Sorry, your pastors don't tweet, but, but anyhow. So every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. That certainly could be said of Saul slash Paul, and it can be said of us as well. And that reminds us of where we came from, and it gives us hope of, where we're, uh, of what is yet ahead of us. Amen? Truly, amen. So here we have the confrontation. And as we look at the confrontation, so you'll see wherever there are italics, this comes from chapter 2 or 26. But I want us to look at this in a different way. Because Saul was a bad character, okay? He was a bad dude. He was a bad guy. Nobody... And nobody would say he's a good guy, right? Here's, he, he, he's, he's, he would, you wouldn't have wanted him living next to you. Let me put it that way. Um, but I want us to think of something else this morning as we look at the confrontation and what God does. And I want you this morning to think of your own life before you became a Christian, okay? I want you to think of your own life. And I want you to think of the process you went through to becoming a Christian. Now, some of you may have had, if you came from a Christian family, you may have had a stronger confrontation in your life at some point in your Christian life. I know for me, that confrontation came after I had been uh, a Christian for a while, but it was a strong, a strong conf confrontation because I became a Christian when I was very young, and it was older when I had that confrontation of what truth really was and my life and Jesus and maybe the same thing would be said of you but this is what I want you to think about and I want you to think about what your life was like before you became a Christian okay and I want you as we look at this to think of what it took for God to get you to where you are now what did it take for God to turn your heart towards him 
and I gave the example in the first service. In my apartment out in New Territories, I have this wooden box, and it's my tool box. Um, and I inherited it from my dad, who, as you know, was a great handyman. And I've added a few of my own tools since then. Knowing some of you, I'm sure you have a toolbox. For example, I know Big Steve has a toolbox, doesn't he? I know Kim has to have a toolbox. You got a toolbox? There you go. I know Brother Mike has a toolbox, right, Brother Mike? And probably, Stephen, do you have a toolbox? Oh, oh, Big Steve has two toolboxes. <laughs> okay. And some of us have the phone number for the handyman in the village, right? But in my toolbox, I have several hammers. You say, well, why do you need several hammers, Pastor Jennifer? Isn't one hammer enough? No, one hammer's not enough. I've got a little tiny hammer, right? It's got a little head, and it's a tack hammer. And sometimes when I have little, you know, little tacks and things, I'll use that little tack hammer. Then I've got another hammer that is kind of a regular sized hammer, you know, just a whatever. And I use that for other nails and things and pieces of wood and whatever. And then I had, but it was too big for me, so I gave away. I had a sledge hammer, you know. Head was this big, handle was about this long. I don't know what my dad used that for. <laughs> But I gave it away to the church, okay? And then I've got another one that has a rubber handle, has a rubber head uh, that's used for cars and things like that and, and for other. So I've got all these hammers. Well, why do you need four hammers, Pastor Jennifer? Because different situations require different hammers, right? Different hearts require different dealings. Mm. Different characters require different handlings. And depending on your heart, depending on your character, I shouldn't say your, our, I should say our, let's include all of us. Depending on our hearts, depending on our characters, depending on our stubbornness or our set or the way we've been going and the number of years we've been going that way, the Lord deals with us differently. I believe that if God can use his little tack hammer on us, that's what he's going to choose. Because I found in my own life that when I need a little tap, God doesn't get out his biggest tool and go whack on me, because that would break me. And that would, and we all need breaking at times, but that would crush me and damage me. And that's not what I need. And you don't need that either. Unless we're in a place where we're really stubborn and really hard and really set. And then God may have to go into his toolbox and get the bigger hammer. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Do you think that's true? Yes. I think that's true. I don't have a specific verse for that except in the Old Testament where it says a bruised reed he won't break. God will be as gentle with us as he can. He really will. He really will. But brothers and sisters, because he loves us, if it takes something harder, he will use something harder to bring good out of that relationship that he wants to have with us and out of our lives as well. Does that make sense? And so we look at Saul. And me, I think Saul was a tough nut to crack, to use an American expression. I really do. He was so proud and arrogant. You say, well, Pastor Jennifer, you shouldn't talk about one of the pillars of the church in that way. I'm telling you what Saul said about himself. Saul said, I was proud, I was arrogant, and he said, and I, I depended on my own self-righteousness. I was the best of the best. I kept the law better than anybody else. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, nobody could find fault with me in keeping the law. You say, he said that? Yes. Yes, he said that. First Timothy chapter 1, on your page at the end. He said all these things about himself. It was going to take something hard to turn the heart of Paul. And so we see in the confrontation what happens. Let's see what happens. He's on the way to Damascus. And, and an intense light from heaven, brighter than the sun, suddenly shone down, flashed around him. He fell to the ground. Later on, he will say that his companions also fell to the ground. But Luke truncates uh, this, this story. He doesn't tell us everything. And later on, we find out more. And then he 
fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him in the Hebrew language, in Aramaic, so it would have been Paul's, Saul's mother tongue, okay, it would have been the language of his heart, right? God speaks the language of our heart when he really wants us to hear him, right? It's the language of his heart. And, he, and the voice said, Saul, Saul. Now to us, that's not particularly meaningful, but to a devout Jew who knew Old Testament scriptures, a voice from heaven that calls your name twice means it's God and you better pay attention. That's what it, that's what it meant. That's what it meant. And the voice said something that let Saul know the one who's speaking to me knows exactly what's in my heart and knows my plans, knows everything about me. Why are you persecuting me? What? Saul would have said at this point, if he knew it was God, he would have thought, God, I'm not persecuting you, God. I'm helping you. Have you ever thought you, huh, yeah. Have you ever thought you were helping God? I have, and then you found out some point down the line, oh God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was really, I was really messing things up right there. So he says, the voice says, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now I asked in the first service, and nobody in the first service had ever driven oxen before. Has anybody in this congregation ever driven oxen before? You've either plowed with oxen in a field, or you've driven? Oh, we have, we have farmers who have driven oxen, okay? Or former farmers who have driven oxen. What is a goad? It can be any number of things, but simply it was sharp sticks that would be used by the, the farmer or the person guiding the ox, and it would be used to keep the ox going in the direction that the farmer wanted him to go, not that the ox wanted to go. The ox maybe said, forget this row, I want to go sit under the tree, it's hot. <laughs> and the farmer with the goad basically said, no, we're going to plow this row. And stubborn oxen would pull harder and push harder, and really stubborn oxen would, <laughs> they'd kick, they'd kick. The voice from heaven and Saul knows it's God, says to Saul, basically, you are a stubborn ox trying to go your own way instead of the way I want you to go. You say, all of that is in there? Yep, it is. All of that is in there. And when, and, and here's a lesson for us as well, because you and I also are like stubborn ox at times and we get poked and we get pricked and it's hot, it's hard, and it's painful and instead of saying, okay God, I, instead what do we do? We kick also. And what the Lord says to us is, it's hard. If you kick against the goats, it's hard. It's, it's always, it's always going to be hard. But what we see in this confrontation is this dramatic this, dr this dramatic event as Saul is being humbled right now. Now, he's not fully humbled yet, is he? He's about to be humbled. Are you ready for what comes next? Because here's the first question. Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Now, as we look at this, I want to ask you something. If you are a Christian this morning, at some point in your life, in some way, you asked this question. Did you know that? You asked this question. You said, well, no, I didn't. I came from a Christian family. I didn't ask this question. Yes, you did. You may not have phrased it this way. You may not have said it this way. But if you have come to the Lord at some point in your life, you came to the point where you, God confronted you and you confronted God with who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? May I put it in other wor words, in other terms? Lord, are you the Lord of my life? Lord, are you going to take charge of my life? Lord, are you this or are you that? Now, if you're around people who aren't Christians, and when they come to this question, they will say as 
they will say, oh, well, he wasn't God, but, you know, but he was a good teacher. Have you ever talked with somebody who said Jesus was a good teacher? Anybody? I have. Well, he was a good teacher. Well, that's just absolutely rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. If somebody says, well, Jesus was a good teacher, but he wasn't God, because Jesus said, I am God. Now, either Jesus was lying and didn't believe he was God, but he says, I'm God, because he wanted people to follow him, in which case he was terrible and not a good teacher, or he really believed he was God and he wasn't, in which case he was kind of crazy. Josh McDowell says, Lord, lunatic, or liar. That's what Josh McDowell says. It's true. Lord, lunatic, or liar. Or, he is Lord. This morning, if you're not yet a Christian, if you have not yet come to the place where you have had this encounter with God, this is the question for you. Who is God? Is he God? Is he Lord, lunatic, or liar? And if you haven't thought about it before, you need to think about it. When Saul asks this question, he's very sincere. He's not trying to find, he's not asking a theological question. Do you know what? When people find out I'm a pastor, sometimes I don't even want to tell people I'm a pastor. You say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're ashamed of being a pastor. No, I thank the Lord that he called me into the ministry. I truly do. I'm so grateful that he counted me worthy for this calling. But sometimes I don't even want to tell people I'm a pastor. And you know why? because they want to ask a theological question. What about this? And you know, you've, you have discovered this as well, right, pastor? I'll bet you don't always tell people you're a pastor either, do you? No, he doesn't. I know he doesn't. Because you want an open dialogue, don't you? You want, you want people to, you want, you want to talk with people, you want people to talk with you. I hate theological questions, because they don't come from the heart. They're just up here. Well, you know what? You, if, if you stay in the mind, you'll never convince, convince anybody just up here. Now, God can use this, but at some point, a heart has to be grabbed, right? A heart has to be touched. It's both. It's both. And it can never just stay here. And it can never just, and, and it can never just stay here either. Because there are honest questions that people have. And God gives us both, if you will. God gives us both. So I don't even, like to, I don't even want to mess around with theological questions when it's just, well, I want to know. Saul does not ask a theological question. It's a question of the heart, because he already knows everything, doesn't he? If there was ever a good student of the Bible, of the Old Testament, it was Saul. So Saul's question is, who are you, Lord? Because here is one who is showing he is Lord, and he knows Saul, and he's grabbed his attention. So Saul says, who are you, Lord? Mm, look at the answer. Look at the answer. Jesus could have said, I am the Lord God. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am this and I am that. He could have said, I am the Son of Man. I am the one who is dead and now alive. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. All of these things would have been true, right? He doesn't do that. Do you know what Jesus says in answer to the honest question that Saul has? He chooses the name that Saul most despised, that Saul most hated, because to Saul, Jesus was a man. This was his human name. This was his earthly name. This was not God of heaven. This was that cult leader up from Galilee and Nazareth who was dead on a cross five or six years earlier. But it's the voice from heaven that speaks to him and says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. And with that, it wipes out everything Saul has depended on in his life. Everything. Everything is wiped away because Saul knows it's true. Saul knows the one I thought was dead is alive. If he's alive, then he's God. If he's God... The ones I've been fighting against are right and I'm wrong. If he's God, then I've got to change my life. If he's God, then what I've depended on for my righteousness in the law is nothing. Just that quickly, all of those things, all of those things had to go through Saul's mind. And when he asks that question and gets that answer, immediately 
there's another question. Look at what comes next. And then Saul says, in, verse, in the verses following, next verses. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, let me come back to that one. Let me come back to that one. Uh, uh, skip over that. Saul immediately asks, what shall I do, Lord? What shall I do? And I want you to think about that for just a minute. We'll come back to the other, to the other slide. Because his first question is, who are you, Lord? And when he knows who God is, it is, his second question is, what shall I do, Lord? Now, I asked you to think of your life before Jesus. And now I want you to think of this question as well. Because the question that Saul asks is a question that every Christian must ask. Must ask. If you've never asked before, if you've never sought God for this before, you must do this. You don't want to float through this life. And if you haven't asked this question, and if you haven't gotten the answer to this question, then you and I are floating through our lives here on this earth. And we have not yet come to an understanding of God's plan for us. We've not yet come to an understanding of God wants something of our lives. It's not just, oh, I'm a Christian now. Well, I'll go to heaven one day. Praise the Lord. No hell for me. Yay, heaven. And, and I'm saying this to, for us to understand so many of us, I, I'm not making light of, of the gravity of this, but what, I'm, what I am seeing is, saying is so often we just kind of float as Christians. We really, really do. And I want us to see something else. Saul asks the Lord, what shall I do? He doesn't plan it himself. He doesn't figure out himself. He doesn't say, well, this is what I like, so this is what I'm going to do. He looks to, to the Lord and he says, what shall I do? I remember many, many years ago uh, in China, when Pastor Renee and I would go to, uh, uh, we would go to student conferences in China. Uh, Brother Stephen was part of these conferences. Uh, I don't know if Esperanza was or not, maybe, may, maybe not, but others were. And um, we developed wonderful relationships. And I remember meeting this one young man one time um, at one of the conferences, maybe Nanjing, I'm not sure. He was so, so sincere, but his understanding of this was so shallow. And he was so sincere. He really meant it. He came to me after. He says, Pastor, may I talk with you? And I'd seen him praying at the altar. I knew um, that he had a heart for God. And so he came. I said, yeah, 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 sure. Sorry. And so he came and he had this. It was about, sorry, I don't want to bend it. It was about, it was, it was about twice the size of this. And it was a piece of cardboard. And he had things written on it. And he had it laminated. You know, so he had plastic. So it was this lamination. And it was the plan for his life. <laughs> and he was 26 years old, I think. And he said, and he was a student in China. He wasn't yet married. Um, and he said, uh, Pastor, this is the plan for my life. And he said, now I'm going to have four children. <laughs> I, hey, I am not making this up. I'm not making this up. I'm going to have four children. Now, he did not even have a girlfriend yet, by the way. Okay. I, he said, I'm going to have four children. He said, three for me and one for God. <laughs> and I looked at him. I thought, where do I begin? <laughs> where do I begin? Now, we, we laugh. We laugh when we hear that. I promise you that's a true story. I am not exaggerating. There was more. I'm just giving you the highlights. But honestly... You and I are that way sometimes. We've got everything figured out. This is what I like. This is what I want to do. This is how things are going to be worked out. And what I want to say to you is this. The Lord has something for your life. If you've not heard it yet from Him, if you've not asked Him, if you've been sincere and loving the Lord, but just kind of floating along, and I don't mean, by the way, when I, when I say floating along, I don't mean that you're a bad Christian. I don't mean that. I don't mean that you're a half-hearted Christian. I don't mean that. But what I mean is someone who is following God, but who has not yet come to grips with God, what is your plan for my life? What is your purpose for my life? And it doesn't just come, I think, by a little simple prayer. It doesn't just come with, okay, God, what, what do you want me to do with my life? 
I don't think it's that simple and I don't think it's that easy. When we look at the encounter that Saul has with Jesus and everything that he does, everything that Jesus does to bring him to the place where Saul will say, who are you, Lord? And then Saul will say, what do you want me to do? You and I need to get there if we've not gotten there. It took me, I'd been a Christian for many years before I came to the place where I realized and understood God these are the gifts you have put in, you have put in my life and in my these are these are your gifts that you put in me these gifts in me are the gifts the motivational gifts and you have them too we all have them that you want me to use in living my life for you in fulfilling your calling on my life you got to get there and then when you understand that when we get there then that helps shape the course of our lives the direction of our lives there are some things right now that we are praying about that when we understand God's call on our lives his calling on us you won't have to pray about those things anymore. It'll be easy. You'll be able to say, well, of course I don't need to go that direction. That doesn't fit with God's calling on my life. You can look on your sheets. We won't get to it this week. Um, there's no way we'll get to it this week, but you can go ahead and start dealing with that. When you look at God's call on Saul's life, you'll see three things, and it's already on your notes. The question is, does Saul's life and Paul's later life does it mirror the call of God on him? Perfectly. Exactly. 100%. 100%. And when you and I come to that place where we have dealt with God in this area, it, it settles so many things. It makes things a lot easier. It really, really does. It really, really does. You've got to get there, but it's going to take some time. Get together with God. Look at yourself. It doesn't come from, well, this is what I'm going to be and this is what I like. Um, and you don't need to make a laminated card, uh, t three children for me, one for God, <laughs> or whatever. How about three children for God and he can do whatever he wants to with them? Or maybe even no children, but God, my life is yours. And that's okay too. That's okay too, brothers and sisters. God has a good plan for your life. There are times when things will happen in your life. It wasn't what you wanted. It wasn't what you hoped for. It wasn't what was planned. And there may be disappointment in your heart. And there may be, oh God, I didn't want it that way. I wanted it another way. But God, who is God, who is the Lord, is able to take all of these things in your life and in my life, the good, the not so good, the persecution, the hardship, the sickness, the disappointment, the mountaintops, the great victories, and he can take it all and he can fulfill his calling upon your life and my life as well. And there's no better life. That's why Paul can say at the end, and that's how I began this morning, that's why he can say in 1 Timothy chapter 1 when he writes to his son in the faith and he says at the end of his life, I thank God that He gave me the strength to do His work and that He counted me worthy. Even though I was the worst of sinners, He poured out grace and mercy on me. You and I, should the Lord tarry, can look back on our lives and we will have the same testimony that Paul has. You and I may not have a Damascus Road experience. Light may not shine down. You may not be struck to the ground. You may not be an ox that's kicking against the goads. Um, you may not see Jesus personally. You say, he saw Jesus personally? Yes. We'll look at that verse in just a minute. Yes, all of those things, because it took all of those things to bring hard-hearted, self-righteous Saul to the place where he would say, oh, Lord, who are you and what do you want me to do? But you and I can come to the place where we can look back and we can say, oh, your mercy, your grace, your patience was poured out in my life, in my life. That can be your testimony. Brothers and sisters, that should be your testimony. It should be my testimony. Not just, oh, the great Apostle Paul, he was like that, but me, I'm different. I'm kind of a so-so. No, this is, the same, this is the same thing for you and for me as well. Now, I told you to think, and I asked you to think, what was your life before God brought you to himself? And I want to go back to, um, very quickly, maybe we'll come back to this in just a minute, go back to the preceding slide that uh, I did that in the first service as well. And I want you to see very quickly, we're not going to read it all, but look at that. Paul writes about the 
resurrection appearances of Jesus, okay? 1 Corinthians 15. You, do you know when he wrote this? It was about 20 years after his conversion, after the confrontation and the conversion, okay? Because when Saul says, what do you want me to do, Lord? To me, boom, that settles it. That's the conversion. He acknowledges God. He acknowledges the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? But I want you to look at this. 20 years later, it's not recorded in Acts anywhere. Not in chapter 9, not in chapter 22, not in chapter 26. He says all of this about how the risen Christ, he says, I, for what I received, I passed on to you. What do you mean? Where did he receive it? Who did he get this from? This is Paul. Who did he get it from? Did he read it in a book somewhere? He got it from Jesus. He got it from Jesus and he says, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures. He appeared to Peter, the 12, 500. He appeared to James. By the way, may I say something to you as we look at this? I'm so encouraged because Peter, up here, he appeared to Peter. Remember Peter was the one who denied Jesus and yet Jesus appeared to him. He appeared to James. Who was James? His brother. His brother who did not believe. They lived together and he did not believe he was the son of God. Well, you're just my brother Jesus. James is included in the appearances. And then what does it say in verse 8? And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I'm the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Do you know what Saul and Paul, do you know, do you know who he's taught? You know what he's talking about? Do you know when he's talking about when he writes verse 8? Do you know when it is? On the road to Damascus. On the road to Damascus. Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. What does it take to break a hard heart? What does it take to humble a proud soul? For Paul, it took Jesus personally appearing and saying, I'm Jesus. Now before you say, I want Jesus to appear to me in a vision, be careful about praying that because out of that great glory and out of that great blessing, Saul lived a life 100% sold to the Lord, sold out to the Lord, completely devoted to Him and in great persecution. You know, I started for myself because I've been studying the book of Acts since I'm teaching from it. I've started keeping an account. Now, I'm far ahead of you. But I've started keeping a record of every place in Acts where it says they tried to kill him. <laughs> you, want, you want some interesting Bible reading? You read through Acts and record every place people tried to kill Saul or Paul. You'll have a long list. So before we say, oh Lord, this revelation, oh Lord, count the cost. And he says, he appeared to me. But out of that came a conversion so mighty, so mighty, so great, that you and I are sitting here this morning because of that. You say, I'm a fruit of Saul? Yep, I am too. We all are. We all are. We'll find out in heaven the, the river that it took to get to us. But we are, because we're all Gentiles, right? We're, we're in that river. Oh, how wonderful. Because Saul understood God. He was converted. Lord, what do you want me to do? And God said, get up. We'll talk about this next week. It's time to, or the week after, whenever, whenever we come back to it again. But I love it, because I think, I think God has a sense of humor. We're going to pray in just a minute, but I think God has a sense of humor because, you know, Saul is lying on the dirt 
on the road. And he says, what do you want me to do, Lord? And I think Saul is asking the great question, right? What do I do with my, you know, God, what do you have for me? And God answers the most immediate question. Get up. <laughs> You're lying in the dirt on the road. Get up, Saul. Brothers and sisters, as you seek God and as he opens his call for your life, God will direct you in the day-to-day. -day. I'm not knocking that. We need day-to-day -day guidance at times. But, oh, brothers and sisters, more than day-to-day, -day, we need to know God's calling on our lives and God's hand on our lives. And when we do, it's like a ship going in one direction, and the wind may blow this way and this way, but we know where we're going. And we'll adjust the sails, but we'll keep on going. Let's close in prayer. Lord, Lord, we thank you. Oh, God, we thank you that you took a big hammer for Saul because that's what he needed. But, Lord, we're grateful that our brother Saul took it and responded. But, Lord, we don't want to just look back in history. And so, God, we ask the same questions and we ask what are you saying to us in all the things we've looked at this morning Lord in your revelation to us in how you brought us to yourself and the grace and the mercy that's been poured out in our lives and how patient you have been with us and Lord if we need to come to grips with who are you because we haven't yet help us to do that Lord, for some of us, we've not yet come to the place where we have really wrestled with the question, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Lord, may we meet with you. May we wait on you. May we get serious with you and lay down our plans and our laminated card with how we think our lives should go and the plan we have and receive from you a higher and greater calling for your glory and for our good. We thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.